This is the observance night, and uh, we have about three weeks left of this vasa. <coughs> so just as an exercise in awareness, what right now, what is the vasa? So you can Perception, isn't it? Memory, memories arise. In and wasa, three weeks from now is the future, which is in the present. And thinking about the end of us, Pavarana day, Katinas, these haven't happened yet. The future, these things are likely to happen, but maybe, the, who knows what will happen. The world might end before the end of the Vasa. <laughs> Just to reflect on the way it is, future is what hasn't happened yet, so we project. You know, we end of Vasa, Katinas, next year, It'll be the bring the autumn equinox in a couple of days, <coughs> when the days and nights are even. And then it goes into days get shorter and the nights longer. And in the beginning of Vasa, the memory, and we made our determination and everything that's happened up to this moment. <coughs> no memory, memories arise according to conditions. Uh, we wouldn't be thinking about the beginning of Vasa right now if, if I didn't bring up the subject. So conditions for recalling the beginning of Vasa are here. So that memory will arise so this is a way of reflecting on the way it is. They're always returning to the moment, the here and now. <coughs> so then, memory, we remember only certain things. We don't remember everything that's happened during this vasa. Just the, the more, maybe the pleasant or the most difficult things that have happened to you during this time, you might remember. <coughs> the future, who knows what? Enlightenment, uh, finding true bliss and happiness, uh, might end up in total despair, suicidal, might be a terrorist attack on Amravati. Anything, you know, you, anything you can think of could happen, possible. Martians coming or Venusians, UFOs. You, know, you can even make up total kind of absurd fantasies about it if you want. But in terms of right now, the future is what we don't know, is it? It's not the future, then 
this perception, the word future, the future is about the, the unknown, the potential possibility. <coughs> now this establishes this awareness. This is the way it is. The Dhamma, the way, the Dhamma is the truth of the way it is. Um, if you keep reflecting like this, then you break down your <coughs> your illusions about the reality of time. You know, because that's where we live in a society that believes totally in time as reality. Where this is the Western world is, uh, you know, very proud of history, keeping records of the past, preserving Britain there always trying to preserve everything of the past. Any old horrible old house that is any age <laughs> has to be preserved. <laughs> A few years ago, ten years ago, they were trying to preserve the first slum in England, up in Yorkshire. <clears throat> His history, you know, it, it gives us a sense of continuity. It's like your own personal history, doesn't it? It makes you feel like you're some, you've been somebody, a real person, because you have a birth certificate, a passport, and you have memories of, you know, when you were a child, when you went to school, went to work, so forth. And these, these are, <coughs> give us a sense of being somebody that has continuity in time. And so in awareness this dissolves into nothing. And that can be pretty frightening for many, for most people I think, when their egos start falling apart. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's like you're, you're emotionally very, it's terrifying. It's even better to, you know, to hold on to terrible memories. It at least gives you a sense of being somebody that was abused and so forth, and treated badly. <laughs> and that's somebody. That's a memory of being, you know, that if you get a lot of abuse, then it does create a sense of, of being somebody who gets abused. So even, the, even the, the difficulties of life, when we hold on to the memories, <coughs> create this sense of a, of a permanent personality, a soul that, that has, a, has a history to it. Fascinating about previous lives, isn't it? We've become fascinated by what were my previous lives? And uh, because that, that's interesting to think of you know, somebody can can read your aura and you can figure out you were, you know, uh, somebody in China or India or Rome, you know, during the ancient times. You know, several monks have gone to Rome into the Colosseum and remembered being, being killed by lions or wild animals. <laughs> So that you get, it gives you a sense of having been somebody in the past. So right now, what are you? Can you find yourself? You know, can you find? Is there is there a memory that that you can sustain? You know, even a previous life memory of being eaten by lions in the Colosseum, or or yesterday, or the the greatest. Uh, moment of your life, if you remember it, can you sustain anything like that for very long? <coughs> or being abused or unloved or mistreated? So I don't know about you, but I can't. I've tried. <laughs> In the, uh, just to see if I could do it. You know, just as it began to to see just the, the evanescence of memory, there's nothing much to it. 
except when we grasp it and believe in it and uh, and make it we can we can create things around memory so right now say with this reflective or intuitive awareness you know, I can't find anybody because the, you know there's no me the memory I'm not I'm not uh, I can see through the limitation of memory. I'm not looking for myself as some kind that I remember being anything. And I can't create some something and believe in that either. So I can't find a personality that I can say is really mine. The body is again to see is, is just is like you know, the flowers in the garden or anything that grows and, uh, it, you know, lives on this planet. It's just a condition in nature. So at this moment, then there's, you reach this, you begin to recognize, realize this empty point, still point of pure awareness. I can't find Ajahn Sumedho or anything like that. It doesn't mean anything anymore. And yet, you know, if I cling to the to the uh, this name Ajahn Sumedho or whatever, then it then I can uh, you know I can create a, a scenario about me as a personality that ordained and and did this and that in the monastic life. I mean, I have quite an interesting a lot of memories to, to uh, you know, entertain you all about my life as a tomato. <coughs> but in the reality of this moment, there's no, I can't find it. You know, there's this, and and then a lot of the memories that I would tell others, I only tell you the stuff I want you to hear. There's no, it's a selected biography of tomato. <coughs> So these are not trustworthy, you know, these are not anything to, to uh, develop that much interest in or commitment to is oneself as a person or a physical being even. It's important to, to recognize its limitations, not to despise or deny or reject, but to recognize the way it is. So I've been in uh, Norway for the past week. That's a perception, isn't it? Everybody knows Norway is a country in Scandinavia, Northern Europe. And so uh, they can talk about my experiences in Norway. <coughs> And so that Norway now is a memory. Even when I was there, you know, I'm, what am I doing? It's, it's just memories, perceptions rising up. Everybody there in Norway believes they're in Norway. So we all <laughs> agree on that. <laughs> and, and so <laughs> it's, uh, and we call, and we just like we call this England, don't we? We all agree to call this place, England, uh, it actually doesn't have a name, except we give it one. <coughs> right now, Norway is, uh, is, is a memory for you, for most of you, it's an abstraction. You know, if you've never been there, you don't have any memory of it, except reading about it and seeing it on a map. And then we have certain perceptions of what Norway is about snow and skiing and uh, what, what kind of when you say Norway what kind of perceptions arise <coughs> so investigating how, how the mind is you know because these we 
you know, we, we give, you can, you know, in the world today, everybody totally committed to their delusions. You know, the, the, uh, the war and uh, the American occupation of Iraq, uh, Tony Blair, George Bush, these are all perceptions of the mind. And, uh, and yet, we can get very indignant or excited or wound up just by saying these names. Just by, nowadays, just most people I know say George Bush, and they, they, you know, you feel this tension arise. <laughs> it's only, you know, two words. <coughs> w. <laughs> you can't say W anymore without going tense. <laughs> or Tony. Tony is a common name, but now say Tony and everybody, you know, can't trust that guy. So I'm just noting these reactions, not condemning or saying you shouldn't have them, they're just observing the way it is, how, how things can affect us, how the emotions are created around the liking, disliking, approving, disapproving. <coughs> In Norway, they, they had uh, the Thai ambassador invited myself and Ajahn Panya Saro, and so we had, you know, kind of red carpet treatment, staying in the embassy and in Oslo, and a chauffeured Mercedes Benz in our response. <laughs> Black sedan, <laughs> very impressive. And uh, then the uh, ambassador was with us all the time, took a great deal of interest. He's quite interested in meditation. In fact, he's been on retreats here. Well, that's good to see, isn't it? It's to see that, that uh, a Thai ambassador who has a lot of duties and, you know, is, is high up in the social order begins to see through. You know, he's, he's you know, awakened to all the foolishness and pointlessness And yet he's in a, in a, you know, has a good job and highly regarded and <coughs> interesting life. And there comes a point where it's never enough, you know, just to have, you know, high status and wealth and success and all the rest in, 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 on the worldly plane. It's interesting. Norway seems as, you know, almost a perfect country because we, was the, I'm, we were there just in, when the weather is very nice. You know, I don't know how perfect it is in the winter, but in the autumn, it's incredibly beautiful, uh, very clean, much cleaner than England. <laughs> uh, like Oslo is, uh, is, you know, you could eat off the pavement so clean. And uh, you don't see litter and plastic bags lying around like you do in, in London. And uh, everything seems to, you know, be much well-ordered and um, friendly place. Very lovely city, beautiful fountains and parks. They have one park that, uh, that we've enjoyed was the Big Land Park, which is quite famous, well, maybe you might know about it. He it, it was a sculptor who created this park and all these uh, very impressive granite sculptures of, of human beings in various stages of emotion and action, movement. Uh, they have this huge column in the middle, uh, this kind of like a, a mound and this huge column of human bodies sculpted in one piece of granite, very, you know, like this, almost as high as this temple ceiling. 
and, uh, and all these figures of humanity, men, women, old men and old women and children and babies and corpses, uh, all kind of on top of each other in various ways, in various, you know, old naked figures in these kind of sculpted on top of each other in the most amazing way. So it's like all the, this incredible bit of, uh, of interesting art, really, carved out of a solid piece of granite. Very skillful, yeah, very skillfully done. And then of surrounding this, this column are all these kind of gargantuan figures of men and women, uh, all nude, uh, in various poses of despair or in love or anger or depressed or related or uh, the children, uh, old people, thin people, fat people, everything there. And then here, everywhere there's these figures, uh, huge granite figures are, and, and, they, and children are climbing up on top of them. So then, uh, uh, in the same part, the same artist developed the, the fountain at the center. The Norway, thing, they seem to create in Oslo, the most beautiful fountain, water fountains in the park. So it's quite original and very beautiful. And this one is uh, these, uh, it's done in bronze. So it has these kind of very strong figures of men holding up this huge kind of disc with the water coming up and flowing over and then surrounding it is in a square, the, the very stages of birth and death of human men and women in bronze. And they have these kind of in trees, the, the tree figure, the tree figure, and then the, the children or the men and women somehow related in this tree. And the tree is the kind of the, the continuous theme with the human figures, you know, in them or, or r trying to get out of them or hanging on to them or that in, in forms of children, youth, old age, and death. There's even one with a ghost in it. One tree has a ghost in it. So it, it's a good contemplation if you like reflecting on, on these things because it, it's a very humanistic part. And then that's what I found in, in Oslo was uh, everywhere there's, there's figures of human beings everywhere. In all the parks, where we go, uh, naked human beings. Uh, children or whatever. <laughs> and uh, they seem to, you know, it's a country that seems to have kind of um, elevated the sense of being human to... Uh, be their kind of peak of cultural achievement. You don't get the impression that it's a highly religious country, you know, that, it, that spiritually it's a, it doesn't seem all that tuned in. The churches look pretty empty and like museums. And, uh, and then with all these figures, in the Big Land Park that are, you know, doing all these various things, these passionate poses or depressed or, or angry, or men fighting or, or whatever. There's no, uh, uh, nobody's ever created a Buddha image. I've noticed this in, in Western iconography, even in Christian iconography, there's no kind of equivalent to a, a Buddha, Buddha Rupa. Is just contemplating this uh, the, that the Buddha Rupa is uh, is a kind of to me a uh, kind of ultimate achievement in presenting the human form in in perfect balance, isn't it? Where the eyes are open, uh, there's composure, there's 
you know, it's not depressed or angry or uh, laughing hilariously, uh, but calm and clear and balanced, a sense of emotional balance and, and uh, equanimity, enlightenment, the human form that had, that where the, the uh, consciousness is no longer clung to out of ignorance. <coughs> so, in this way, the, the, uh, the Buddha icon is, to me, a kind of the ultimate product of, uh, you know, that comes out of contemplation, reflection, and experience. So in, uh, you know, in the, we, we're used to the passionate forms in uh, European culture, aren't we? The, the warriors and the kings and the queens and the, and the uh, <coughs> scientists and the, the uh, you know, everything from gnomes to dwarfs to fairies and, and whatever variations on, on human form in either exaggerated or, or photographic likenesses, uh, the human form is, uh, you know, is, is the vehicle that we all are experiencing at this moment. So, uh, as, you know, then, then the when we when we go into ex take on the the position, say of ideals, you know, of becoming something, becoming the king or the warrior or the the queen or the the common man or the whatever whatever role you you incline to, you know, on a personal level, then we tend to develop into that. We become like that. Whatever we grasp, we become what we are grasping. If we're, you know, if we feel despair and hopeless, then, then we become someone who's depressed. If we want to become a, you know, a, a warrior, one who fights and is heroic, then we have to do things to prove that we, we are that way, the identity of a hero. And yet, how many heroes, you know, you, you might be sculpted and put into a public park as a great hero, but the, the, the man or woman themselves, how can you hold on and be a hero 24 hours a day? You know, the, the, you, can, you can make it out of granite, which can last hundreds of years, but the actual moment is very brief of the joy, the kind of exultation of, of being heroic is not a, not a condition that you can sustain. It's very brief and then it's gone. Being a winner, a champion. <clears throat> so then if your if you're, things you're grasping are so high up, and, you know, the higher they are, the 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 you know the more difficult they are to sustain. Uh, so if you get too refined and too special, then it it it's uh, hard to maintain that the illusion of being that for very long. So then we kind of sink into a just common, just a nobody. I'm just a nobody, just an ordinary guy, really. You know, I'm special talents done all right. <laughs> and uh, getting by, and that's what we often you hear in, in England. You know, people just committed to a level of kind of mediocrity <laughs> as themselves, because at least that's more sustainable, isn't it, than, than having to always be the hero, or the champion. Mm. 
So, uh, you know, that's hard work, sustaining that illusion of the, the, the extreme extremities. Imagine you go into the hell realm, being really evil would be a hard one to sustain. You know, if you really committed to being the most evil human being on the planet. Um, but I think the, the miserable states seem to last longer than the, than the ethereal ones. <laughs> It's not fair, is it? But it is just the way it seems. <laughs> like heaven, uh, you know, a more uh, five minutes of happiness, you know, is very brief. It's like a second, it's over. Five minutes of misery is like an eternity. Like when you're looking at the clock waiting for the bell to ring, five minutes and your legs are aching. And you think, just be patient. Five minutes is not very long. And you know, five minutes have gone by, and you look at the clock. Only one minute is gone. <laughs> and then you start hating the monk in charge of the bell because you think he's doing, not bringing it deliberately to torture you. And you start projecting. So by, by even grasping the fact that well, I'm just a nobody, an ordinary guy with, you know, that, that is also uh, a created. That's a cre created condition. It's not the way it is. Or we might see ourselves in more negative terms even. It's like I'm hopeless, I'm no good, I'm can't do anything right, and that and we get into really depressive mental states. And it's interesting, the ambassador said that Norway has the highest suicide rate in Europe. So I thought, you know, this is perfect a place as, to live in as you could find on this planet. Why isn't everybody happy? Yeah, it's well run, good government, Welfare system from cradle to grave, take care of you no matter what. Wealthy, clean, beautiful, democratic, uh, sounds, you know, it sounds as good as you'll, you can find and yet has a high suicide rate. Why is that? Why would, if, if everything was so, so nice like that, why would people want to kill themselves. And it's strange, that's, that's what happens, isn't it? The, the higher suicide rates are usually in the affluent, affluent world. <coughs> and this, because, the, you know, if you, one thing about uh, being poor and where you have to strive to survive, there's a purpose to your life, isn't it? You know, if, you, if you've just got to, you know, got to forget yourself and just try to find enough rice to feed yourself and your family for the day, you can't, you can't think about life all that much and how, you know, about yourself. You've got to put some effort into just basic survival. Not that I'm promoting poverty as, as, as <laughs> and that, but I'm just reflecting on when, when life becomes too easy and there's no challenge and we can easily drift into and there's no spiritual goal in it. You're just, you know, you're just looking for happiness and, and uh, you know, you ease and comfort and exciting things and and romance and adventures and all this gets very boring after a while. Just this endless pursuit of happiness and seeking all the time for some, some kind of pleasure through the senses or, or through power or through, um, you know, just through grasping the conditioned realm, the samsara. It's just, after a while, 
if there's no challenge, if there's nothing beyond it, it becomes rather dreary. Like as you get older too, it, you see how, you know, you, you've seen enough and you're a bit weary of it all. You've seen, seen the same things over and over again and the kind of stupidity uh, of your own mind, conditioned mind, and the, and the society you're in. <coughs> so, then you become, you have this nipita, this kind of world weariness. So the Buddha, you know, encouraged us to reflect and know the world is the world. And this means what we create out of ignorance. It doesn't mean the planet Earth. The in when Buddhist term, when the Buddha talks about the end of the world, he's not talking about Armageddon uh, in the in the sense that we mean that, but it's it's pointing to the world we create. Because each one of us lives in our own world, you know, and you begin to recognize you create the world that you're living in. If you're in Norway or England or Thailand or wherever, you and and the kind of memories and and the sense of yourself, your history, your status, all these are things you create and recreate, keep keep and grasping and believing in. So we can live our lives just seeking adventures and challenges, even the, the, like adventure. I, li I like adventures, you see. So it's always nice to have an, an adventure to look forward to. So this is, an, even in old age, you know, I can't, I'm not so fit anymore, so I, I'm not... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I do. I went to the uh, uh, museum in Oslo where they have all the where the expeditions of the Arctic, and they have the boat, the big boat, the Fram that that caught the northern northwest passage, and had all these photographs. And <coughs> I find it's just incredibly interesting, you know, the Arctic, having you know been there last May, and then. Then the, the this this kind of intensity of effort that the like Nansen and people like that put into finding the the Northwest Passage in the early part of last century, and uh, they could be iced in, you know, caught up in the North all winter long in the freezing cold, and they chose the boat is completely covered with ice and snow, and, and just you know being stuck. Not knowing if you're ever going to get out of the, this, and uh, and yet there's something exciting about it, and yet you have to be patient because you know you, you're going to spend six months frozen in a, you know in a frozen ship uh, surviving. But there is a level of purpose to one's life, then, isn't it, to survive? And you're on the edge. And you're going to survive and get out of there. There's some kind of thrust to one's life, meaning, you know, it, winning, achieving, being the one who, who finds the Northwest Passage, who goes to the get find gets to the North Pole first. That gives one a purpose. But going back to Oslo, sitting in your nice, lovely flat and with its central heating and double glazed windows, <laughs> you want to kill yourself. No meaning anymore. <laughs> because if that's all you have to look forward to, isn't it? It's just central heating and thick carpets and pickled herring and. <laughs> It, it kind of, you know, it's, it's it's nice when you don't have those things, but once you have them, then they become meaningless.
So in the, the monastic life, you know, being a Buddhist monk, that's an adventure because you, you get frozen in sometimes. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you go through various things. But the whole point, isn't it? It's got a purpose for this realization. The, um, at least this for me, this has been, been a great adventure. Because of the, the way my mind works. You know, just noticing what a tyrannical superego I have and having to learn how to understand that and how to not get caught not get hooked by it because it's very powerful and it's supported by cultural conditioning and, and the way everyone thinks anyway it's not just some kind of neurotic freaky thing of mine it's, it's very much conditioned by uh, society and the family and ethnic background that I'm from. The sense of self and, uh, and, and the judgment, judgmental side. Incredible critic that, uh, that uh, complains and, and uh, criticizes endlessly me. So living with this has not been, uh, you know, not been an easy ride being having these these conditions in, in consciousness because uh, even though to you I might look like easygoing character uh, you know it's it's not it's not been easy because it's a constant challenge to not get hooked or if you get hooked to 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 wake up to that and and once you recognize that the, the hooks are your own attachment. You know, it's not like anything's hooking me, it's just how I attach to, to those habits of mind, the critical faculty. Or the emotional habits that I have. How so, I'm so ashamed of a lot of them, some of the emotional habits. You know, not because they seem so stupid and immature. Or, you know, the vanity and conceit or the, the, uh, these kind of mental states, you know, are humiliating, embarrassing. And, uh, you know, because one doesn't want to be seen in the hopes other people don't notice because we have the conceit of wanting to be somebody, you know, an image of something in the society where you, you, people uh, look up to you and, and respect you and like you. And then your, your fear of, of being rejected or being criticized or humiliated in some way by the society or by others or even one other person like being humiliated is, brings out rage in me. Somebody humiliates me, I feel, I could, you know, I could, if, if I didn't respect the Bana de Bata precept, I could easily be a murderer. I felt like murdering people sometimes, especially when, when humiliated. <clears throat> So, and then, so that they, the, um, and yet life does provide us with endless humiliations, isn't it? Old age is, is, you know, it's getting increasingly humiliating to my ego. Uh, it's not kind. <laughs> you know, so then uh, the, the decrepitness of an aging body and the, and so forth is uh, is not you know isn't how the ego wants to be seen. You know, you want to be seen as still vigorous, strong. Find yourself caving in and and not walking so quickly and 
your joint seizing up a bit, things like this. And if your ego is strong, you know, not wanting to, to be considered old, like we're very, you know, we're, we're a youth, uh, raised youth to a high pinnacle of, of I, you know, that's what we'd like to be all the time, young and beautiful forever. And yet, that's not the way it is. That reaches a peak and then it's downhill. That you, you don't get younger. So then the, the, the awareness, isn't it? The Buddha pointed to old age, sickness, death as the messengers. They're the, they're the things that, that wake us up. Oftentimes it, being healthy and young and beautiful can make us very dozy. You know, we can, we can have a lot of pleasure riding on those kind of conditions, identifying with them, but you can't sustain them. So the signs of old age or sickness, uh, disabilities, death and loss, separation, seeing the loved ones die, being around dying people, sick people and so forth are, they are they're the oftentimes for many of us the awakening the awakener to beginning to look at life not complain about it and blame God or whatever for it but begin to what is it all about what is its purpose what is its meaning what is it all about anyway So when you start asking those questions, then you start, you can't get the answers from anybody. You don't, you don't want an answer, you just, the, those very questions open you up. Because you have to stop just grasping and repeating the same things and start noticing, observing, witnessing, paying attention to all the habits you've already acquired, to the body. not not to complain about it because it's getting old and, and blame God for, for ruining your beautiful appearance, but to understand it. You know, we, we, we can't just take it for granted. Like when you're young and healthy, you can take a lot for granted. You can make your body do anything you want almost. <clears throat> but then you can't sustain that. And that you... you uh, it lasts for a while and then it, it, you can't do it anymore. The body will not <clears throat> do what you want. And then when you get into middle age and old age, you know, it's not going to do what I want. It's, it's going to be the way it is. So it's learning to, to, to recognize this, to open to it. So it's not a, a rejection or a dismissal of it, but a, a willingness to, to understand it, to learn from old age, sickness, death, separation, sorrow, and grief. So it's not a depressing thing that Buddhism is about suffering and grief and despair, because that is really not understanding the, the Buddha in any way decent at all. It's, it's pointing to these, uh, in order to awaken, to turn to, to understand, rather than running away from them. Because the usual reaction is to run away from anything unpleasant, get away from it. As soon as we have pain in the body, give me a Give me an anodyne, an analgesic, an aspirin, paracetamol, morphine, <laughs> anything. <laughs> and I can get rid of it as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, they want to get rid of any emotional discomfort or physical discomfort as quickly as possible. It's a, a very natural reaction, it's not unnatural. But if that's all we do, then, then our life is increasingly more difficult as you get older. So, 
the Buddha's advice was to understand. It means to turn to something. To understand something, you have to accept it, recognize it, allow it to be what it is, not try to complain about it because it, it isn't what you want. But even if it's what you don't want at all, you, have, you can understand it, learn from it. So then this is the practice of awareness, sati sampachanya. Then in the adventure, realm of adventure, it's, a, it's, a, it's not like you just suddenly solve the problem and then it's an easy ride. It's, it's, it, you learn, you discover how to learn from the way it is as the, things, as the conditions change. So, you, you know, you, you're, you're discovering or you're realizing, recognizing the way of understanding the conditions for what they are, the way it is, the suchness, the the datta da in Pali they use this datta da, the taka da. The, this this word conveys uh, what they are translating as suchness or as is, the way it is. So it's it's not you know as soon as you want to label and judge the way it is, then it becomes more than what it is. You know as soon as I name something, it's slightly more than what it is. It's learning to trust in the awareness before a name for anything comes up. So it's a kind of going into this empty state, not disappearing into a, a void of nothingness, but recognizing when the, when the, aware, when the consciousness is quite empty, when you're not grasping anything, when there's awareness of being, Before you, you know, you acclaim it or judge it or even name it. When we give names to things, then it, then we go fall back into the old patterns of what I like, don't like. This is good. This is bad. This is right. This is wrong. You know, so we 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 get into it's wrong. I'm right. You're wrong. And we get caught back into the cycle of of our super egos and our emotional habits. So it, it, we get caught in this swirling cycle of samsara again. So the way out of that is to is through awareness of it. So this uh, is to uh, encourage you to, because it does, because you know, trying too hard and uh, and always trying to get something from meditation. You know, you're you're not going to get what you want. So. If you, you know, if you preconceive some goal of what you want, you know, you're not going to get it. So it's going to be terribly disappointing. Some people feel they're very disappointed having meditated for years because they're always expecting to get something that they never quite get. Or if they do get, they lose. Anything you get, you lose. There are even attainments in in concentration and all that, you're going to lose them. You can't sustain them. So it's it's a different, you know, the, the that attaining is a worldly 
condition, attitude, that's the way the world operates. Getting something, achieving something, becoming is, uh, is, is the worldly mind uh, way of thinking. It's the way we, we see ourselves or even our meditation practice or we even interpret Buddhism in those terms. Even though that's not what is that, but it doesn't work. If you're going to practice, it doesn't work like that. You don't attain. You don't get something, or if you do, you you lose it. You know, I've 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 attained. You know, refined states, and I lose them. Uh, you know, so, and then you keep, and then you want them when you lose it. You know, and then you remember you want it again. So you go, you try to get it again. You know, you keep doing all the things that you remember doing, you know, to, to get those blissful states. And then um, sometimes you might get it, <laughs> uh, you know, but you, you can't keep it. And it, after a while you, you know, you get very into c controlling everything. You've got you've to control everything around you. So, to me, that isn't, I'm not interested in that. That, as such, always leads to a kind of despair and disappointment anyway. So, what I found more useful is in the, in the awareness of that, of, of trusting in this awareness in the here and now. learning to recognize it, to really appreciate it, treasure it. <clears throat> so it's not like an attainment, it's through real, by paying attention and learning to to recognize what grasping, what, what, how grasping, you know, when you, when you, you can't do it, you're grasping something and you're trying to get something or you, you grasp the idea of what I'm saying but yeah, and you don't see that you're grasping it. But as you begin to observe just the, the tension of grasping, of wanting, of not wanting, of trying and all the rest, then you begin to, to see that the, the, the attention that is sustainable is not through just, you know, Willfulness, the, some, the right, effort, right effort is, is a balanced effort. Not just, a, you know, me determining to get it. So it becomes more, more sense of open receptivity, kind of relaxed attention, a listening, an attunement to now and, and uh, really willing to look at things as they are, the anicca dukkanata of the, of sankharas. You know, th those are the ways to investigate, to just notice the, the, the limitations of conditionality. So it's, you know, it is, its nature is, is like this, the grasping is, is the cause of the suffering. So it's the grasping of samsara, not samsara even. So it's back to this grasping. And then, then you, you see that grasping, how the, you know, whenever you're suffering, uh, you're unhappy or upset or angry or depressed or whatever, it's in your, you know, your, your grasp. Um, I, I know that I'm grasping something when this happens. If it, if it, you know, I can feel anger arise. When the conditions, say, <clears throat> for anger are present, somebody hu humiliates me personally, I can feel, I can still feel that rage arising, but I know better than to grasp it. 
there's a difference, isn't it? I'm not the 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 karma. I still have a karma with that, but it but it more and more the confidence comes in non-grasping. <coughs> then if I should lose mindfulness with it, then I start grasping it and I get wound up with how dare they and into this raging mode. I know there's a point where I, I catch, I see I'm grasping and I practice letting go, relinquishing that. Not in suppressing, not in try, getting rid of the Really knowing, you know, this you can test out for yourself of relinquishing or letting something be letting it be what it is, and then it goes naturally, its nature is to cease. So, you know, don't, don't be upset by the fact that even after years of meditation you still feel anger or lust or things like this. It's, uh, it's, uh, that's not the problem, it's the ignorance, the avicca and the grasping out of that ignorance. So that we we have the, this uh, this awareness as our refuge. So I offer this as a reflection for this evening. <coughs>